Chapter Nine of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Nine. Has God forgotten Shocky? Pap wants to know if you would spend tomorrow and Sunday at our house," said one of Squire Hawkins' girls on the very next evening, which was Friday. The old squire was thoughtful enough to remember that Ralph would not find it very pleasant boarding out all the time he was entitled to spend at Pete Jones's, for in view of the fact that Mister Pete Jones sent seven children to the school, the master in Flat Creek district was bound to spend two weeks in that comfortable place. Sleeping in a preoccupied bed in the furthest corner, with insufficient cover, under an insufficient roof, and eating floating islands of salt pork fished out of oceans of hot lard, Ralph was not slow to accept the relief offered by the hospitable justice of the peace, whose principal business seemed to be the adjustment of the pieces of which he was composed. And as Shocky travelled the same road, Ralph took advantage of the opportunity to talk with him. The master could not dismiss Hannah wholly from his mind. He would at least read the mystery of her life, if Shocky could be prevailed on to furnish the clue. Poor old tree," said Shocky, pointing to a crooked and gnarled elm standing by itself in the middle of a field. For when the elm, naturally the most gracious of trees, once gets a bad set, it can grow to be the most deformed. This solitary tree had not a single straight limb. Why do you say poor old tree? Asked Ralph. Cause it's lonesome. All its old friends is dead and chopped down, and there's their stumps a standin' jest like gravestones. It must be lonesome. Some folks says it don't feel, but I think it does. Everything seems to think and feel. See it nodding its head to them other trees in the woods and a wantin' to shake hands, but it can't move. I think that tree must a growed in the night. Why, Shocky? Cause it's so crooked, and Shocky laughed at his own conceit. Must a growed when they was no light, so as it could see how to grow. And then they walked on in silence a minute. Presently, Shocky began looking up into Ralph's eyes to get a smile. I guess that tree feels just like me, don't you? Why? How do you feel? Kinda bad and lonesome, and like as if I wanted to die, you know. Felt that way ever since they put my father into the graveyard, and sent my mother to the poorhouse and Hanner to old Miss Means. What kind of a place is a poorhouse? Is it a poorer place than Means's? I wish I was dead, and one of them clouds was a carryin me and Hanner and mother up to where father's gone. You know, I wonder if God forgets all about poor folks when their father dies and their mother gets into the poorhouse. Do you think He does? Seems so to me. Maybe God lost track of my father when he came away from England and crossed over the sea. Don't nobody on Flat Creek cure for God, and I guess God don't cure for Flat Creek. But I would though, if he'd get my mother out of the poorhouse and get Hanner away from Means's, and let me kiss my mother every night, you know, and sleep on my Hanner's arm, just like I used to afore father died. You see. Ralph wanted to speak, but he couldn't. And so Shocky, with his eyes looking straight ahead, and as if forgetting Ralph's presence, told over the thoughts that he had often talked over to the fence rails and the trees. It was real good in Mister Pearson to take me, wasn't it? Else I'd a been bound out till I was twenty-one, maybe, to some mean man like Old Means. And I ain't but seven, and it would take me fourteen years to get twenty-one, and I never could live with my mother again after Hanner gets done her time. Cause you see, Hanner'll be through in three more year, and I'll be ten and able to work, and we'll get a little place about as big as Granny Sanders's. And Ralph did not hear another word of what Shocky said that afternoon, for there, right before them, was Granny Sanders's log cabin, with its row of lofty sunflower stalks now dead and dry in front, with its rainwater barrel by the side of the low door, and its ash barrel by the fence. In this cabin lived alone the old and shrivelled hag, whose hideousness gave her a reputation for almost supernatural knowledge. She was at once doctress and newspaper. She collected and disseminated medicinal herbs and personal gossip. 
She was in every regard indispensable to the intellectual life of the neighborhood. In the matter of her medical skill, we cannot express an opinion. For her yarbs are not to be found in the pharmacopoeia of science. What took Rolf's breath was to find Dr. Small's fine, faultless horse standing at the door. What did Henry Small want to visit this old quack for? End of chapter 9